All right. Okay. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Welcome to this week's edition of Paleo Perks. My name is Elizabeth Seibert. I'm one of the organizers, and today it is my great pleasure to welcome Anusha Saha, uh, who is currently at the Institute of Paleobiology in the Polish Academy of Science in Poland. She will be giving a talk today entitled Towards Filling the Gap, Lagomorpha Evolutionary Puzzle. Um, for those of you who haven't been to a Paleo Perks seminar in a while, or perhaps this is your first time, this is just a little reminder of what's to come. Um, we're doing a brief welcome and announcements that will be followed by our talk, and then we'll have a moderated question and answer period, followed by an after the talk informal tea time with the speaker. And we really encourage you to stick around for that. Um, if you have questions throughout the talk, you can send them via chat to the questions at Paleo Perks host. Um, that is Raymond today. And then just some little bits of housekeeping before we get going. Um, paleo Perks values the participation of all folks who are interested in the paleo sciences. So we ask that you please remember to abide by our code of conduct during today's seminar. You should have um, agreed to that when you signed up for the mailing list, but if somehow you are here without having seen it, please pop on over to our website and familiarize yourself with that. Um, we ask that you please remain muted during for the duration of the talk. Um, but that if you have questions, you can ask any questions by sending them via the chat to the questions at Paleo Perks Post or by using the raise hand button at the end of the talk and we'll um, allow you to unmute and ask your question verbally. If you experience any technical issues during the seminar, um, please let us know um, via the questions at Paleo Perks Host in the chat. Oh. A couple of other sort of things. We have closed captions built into Zoom. Um, you can use the CC button to show or hide them. And then we also would like to ask you to um, nominate some outstanding early career speakers to join our seminar series. So if you would like to give a talk about your research or you have a friend who you think would give a really awesome talk, um, we'd always love to hear from you. The nomination form is in the chat. Um, we also um, are going to drop into the chat, or it might already be there, an anonymous, optional, but highly encouraged weekly feedback form. This just helps us keep track of who's coming to these seminars and what we can do to continue to improve them. All right, so enough about perks. Let's get through to today's speaker. So Anusha Saha is our speaker today, and she is actually a biologist turned paleobiologist. She did a bachelor's in microbiology. Um, at St. Xavier's College in Kolkata, at the University of Kolkata in India, and then um, went on to study biodiversity, evolution, and conservation biology at University of College London in the UK. Um, she was then a research fellow for several years at the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and Environment in Bangalore, India, and now she's continued her globe trotting and is um, working on her PhD at the Institute of Paleobiology and the Polish Academy of Sciences in Poland. And today she's going to talk to us all about her work with little tiny rabbits, and I'm really looking forward to hearing it. So go ahead and take over the screen share. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you for such a nice introduction. Okay, so I will start with my talk. Good day, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. So I think it's best to wish everyone in Polish Dzień Dobry, which means good day. <laughs> I think we need to slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll just, okay. Mm -hmm. Can you see my screen? You can see your PowerPoint. And if you want to go for oh, Okay, I'll just go do the slideshow, I guess. Okay. Mm-hmm. Perfect. So hello everyone. I'm going to talk about rabbits today, but uh, not only rabbits, I worked on snails earlier, but what I have common in working between this two really poles apart taxa, it's actually the phylogenetics. I have been working on invertebrates, vertebrates for the last 10 years, but usually building phylogenetic trees from genomic data and sometimes with a little bit of morphological data. So 
Today, I'm going to talk about my PhD work and some research work that I have done before my PhD. Okay, let's take you all through the journey of becoming a paleobiologist from being just a microbiologist. So as you might be aware, evolutionary biology, it's an interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary science. So what people think about evolutionary biology, people do approach this subject from different perspective. People think from genomics, you can actually solve the complex procedure of this subject. Not always that. Some people think if you are being an ecologist or a microbiologist, or maybe you are working on drosophila, or maybe a zebrafish, or maybe a sea elegans, you can too be an evolutionary biologist. But it's such a broad spectrum, it actually brings a lot of specific subjects under its umbrella. So here you can see, I was mostly moving through genomics, geometric morphometrics, biogeography, little bit of wildlife conservation, genomics of course, which is leading to actually how the climate change is affecting the evolution of the species. I'm working on rabbits, hares, and pikas. So basically all of us, all evolutionary biologists in a way are trying to save the planet so that we can live in, we can let our next generation also live. Okay, so here we go. I have like put a really funny tree of life, which is not exactly a, technical phylogenetic tree. That's we, what we usually see in the papers. This is actually for our good understanding and we, I actually put it like so that you love it a little bit more. So as you can see, I used mostly the genomics data and also morphological data, like the shape data of skulls, dental uh, makeup, everything to build a phylogenetic tree and then use behavioral data on top of it, integrate it with climate change data and some other environmental data and behavioral traits as well to find the microevolutionary process which is leading to the current state of an animal. So when I began my career way back in 2008, I was doing my bachelor's and I started with this tiny microorganisms all the viruses and the bacteria, but that did not enchant me that much. But what always enchanted me and thrilled me, it's the genetics and their behavioral aspect. Then I moved a little bit along the tree where you can see some molasses, which is like rounded in red. And I have put a picture on the right side as well. I worked on them for more, almost more than three to five years actually. So before my master's I worked for a year and later I worked for three years. And also with Sicilians, frogs and some reptiles, but that's a very brief one. Finally, moving into rabbits, hares and pika, but nobody can push me to do any work on the humans. I'm not very happy with the homo sapiens. I'm so sorry, okay. Okay, so let's give you all a brief introduction about the taxonomic order Lagomorpha, which comprises of the rabbits, hares, and pikas. I hope all of you have heard about the cartoon Pikachu. So basically the pika, which looks like a tiny rodent, they are actually found in different mountains in uh, North America and Asia, all across Asia in the mountains mostly. So this Pikachu cartoon actually came from the pika. So here you can see, this is actually the tree of life for Lagomorpha. They become a cluster called glyre along with rodents. So it's approximately, there are three families belonging to 13 genera and about 96 to 110 species. I'll come to that why the taxonomic uh, uh, number is like different. 
and they are part of the larger super order called Eurocontoglas. You can see there are other three orders, primates, Dermoptera, Scandentia. So in a way, I can tell you that Lagomorpha is actually closest to our, uh, closest to the human being. So we are kind of their ancestors, could be, but why? So initially when I started my PhD, the idea was to figure out that how this lagomorph and rodents clusters, the gliars actually, fit into this Eurocontoglar tree. But the problem is with the scandentia. They are the tiny tree shoes found in Asia, Southeast Asia actually, in Indonesia, Malaysia, and a few in India. So you can see it's only like 23 species belonging to four family and just, uh, sorry, four genera and two families but their position is not yet resolved. That's a big problem. So the people, especially the paleontologists who are working on all these Eurocontoglar fossils, since this living tree is not yet resolved, they cannot put the fossils properly. So that was the initial idea to resolve this position. But thanks to COVID, we couldn't do it. And we have to push our work or, and like restrict it to only the rabbits for the time being. So within Lagomorpha, there are three families. One family is extinct, okay? It's around like 300 years ago. It got extinct. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, it's great, okay. So, and the largest family with most of the genus and species is Leporidae, which has around, my chat up here. So you can see that has Lepus around 32 species is there. Then Silvilagus, the second most species genera, almost 21 species. Then we have seven monotypic genus there, Orictolagus, Brachylagus, Gunolagus, Caprolagus, Poilagus, Romerolagus, Pentalagus. This seven genera is kind of endemic to different countries of the world, like starting from the New Zealand, Japan to California. We have, but most of the endemic species are there in around Asia. And for and the funniest part, like although people have worked a lot on the lepus and Oryctolagus is the model uh, organism, which we often use as a pet or a model organism in the lab. So that's our laboratory animal, the European rabbit. But the second most species, Silvilagus, people rarely have worked on. Although there are certain groups now, they have started working on it. The second group is the Ohotoni D family, which has only one genus called Ohotona, where our Pikachu belongs, okay? So, and the last one, which is the extinct one, Prolagidae, Prolagus cerdus. This is known as Sardinian pica, which is found in the Sardinia, island of Sardinia. Now, if you go to go and hunt in the caves, you will only find their bones, which got extinct. And recently, like just two days ago, there's a paper came out by Uzzeri et al. And they actually tried to generate the reference mitogenome, but it's a very poor quality one, but they still try it. So let's see all our ventures still going on okay so, so the basic research background for my work was when i started so the problem was like how to get a complete phylogenetic tree for the lagomorphs because still now the genus and the family level lagomorph phylogenies it's not complete yet in 2005 but uh, uh, an article by Ro robinson and marty they tried to include all genus of leporid and they tried to build a phylogeny but we still do not have the all three families together not yet because the problem was due to high degree of homoplasy in morphological characters everything looks same so you cannot even like from the morphology, from their coat color, it is so difficult to figure out which species is which one. Everything is mixed. What about the genomic data? Even with the genomic data, you I hope that people might be aware of using mitochondrial genes. Like this is quite easy to generate and people use it like every day. Those who are working on phylogenies, molecular phylogenies, I must, must say. But in the mitochondrial phylogeny, the problem is 
it's all mixed up. It's due to the ancient hybrid hybridization and a lot of recurrent integration. You will see it's it looks like everything is similar. You just simply cannot differentiate between the species. So what to do? We need to increase more markers. Let's move on to the nuclear thing. So despite this group has so many interests, it has such a unique position in the Eurocontugular superorder tree. People mostly worked on primates and rodents. I don't know why not this one. I'm guessing that uh, collecting all the monotypic genus from the Southeast Asian countries, it's a bit difficult due to social and political bureaucracy and other issues. So many red tips, unfortunately. So in my work, we decided to generate full length mitogenomes and use the nuclear ultra conserved element to investigate whether this taxonomic anomaly could be resolved or not. Great, so we started our work at the end of 2019. After one year of research, like what we could get and let's talk to the museum and let's get all the field permits and everything. Okay. So in my work, of course, I have to resolve the extant uh, rabbit's phylogeny, but how should I choose that which species I must have in our tree? So here I have to give a brief idea about what kind of fossils do I have for rabbits. There are several fossils found all across Mongolia, Kazakhstan, the Central Asia, East Europe, and then also in North America. Here I'm going to mention about two which is really important. Here on the right-hand side, you can see a tree. And you can see there's something called this Duplicy dentata lagomorpha. And here you can see the Ohotona, Prolagus, and Lepus, those three families of the living lagomorpha, although Prolagus is not a living one, but still paleontologists think this just went extinct 300 years ago. This is not exactly a good fossil for us. It has to be some million years ago, okay. But whatever fossils we have, it's near actually on the base of these three families. Those are the same lagomorphs, the paleolagus and megalagus. So in my lab, my colleagues and uh, my professor, uh, they actually described those fossils. Beside these two fossils, they had several other uh, lagomorphs which will fit between the ohotona and lipus. But unless we complete the tree, we cannot place this fossil to do a divergence dating. How will we figure out when do they actually came on Earth and how do they evolve over time? So here is another one. So this is actually a paper by my supervisor from 2010. It is a morphological phylogeny. They used the, uh, dent, uh, the dental makeup, mostly the P4. So, here you can see a lot of uh, Ohotona fossils, which has this cross. So those are the fossils. And then we used also the living uh, Ohotonas inside the tree to see how the fossils and the extant one is fitting into the tree. So to figure out the common ancestor. So depending on this and some other research papers, we figured out which living species must be included in our genomic tree. Great, we made a great list and started looking for it in the field and museum. So this was our research aim. So the first thing was to fill the gap in the genomic knowledge in lagomorphs and try to resolve the species level taxonomic anomaly. So for that, we need the specimens. How will we get the specimens, either from the field or the museums? Okay, here comes the bummer. Ha, 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 COVID. So the entire one year with all my field permits, museum visit, everything is gone. Boom. And not to forget the last one year, the war has been going on. That had been a real bummer. Boom. Then how did I manage to do my PhD still going on? So almost after two and a half years of struggle and like still trying to, you know, knock on every door, just get me some samples, get me something this. So 
I met like I met my collaborators through a virtual workshop. That was nothing but my sheer luck, sheer dumb luck. And there, I mean, obviously, you know how the bureaucracy works, especially with COVID and the war, the international bureaucracy become extremely complicated and it is like nearly impossible to get through. So when I met my collaborators, I managed to get few museum samples from them. It's not like that whatever list we made that we will get, but it was like our sheer luck. So when I met them, they are like, okay, we have some museum samples, some muscle and skin we collected from the uh, Burke Museum and Phil Museum uh, of Natural History, Chicago. But we did not have money for last three years for the genomics work. Will you be very happy to do it? I'm like, oh my God, whatever you give me, it's good for me. And that's how I got lucky with my specimens. I only got like 35 uh, uh, specimens with a variation of different uh, genuses and species, which I wanted to do. And so here you can see some countries are also mentioned, Pakistan, Iran. So these countries are a bit difficult to access. So that's where I want to highlight to all the listeners that museum specimens are a very good source when you cannot go to the field itself. And when you want to work on the morphometrics and with the genomics, it's easy. And in the last one decade, the genomics era has like shot up and it, the cost has gone really less and things have become really faster and with very good computational access to almost everywhere, it's pretty good to use the museum stuff. So that's how I moved into the museum genomics thing, using museum specimens to extract DNA and then regenerate their genome. Okay. Uh, I hope you can see the sampling location. Well, I did not go there in person, although I wanted to visit, but the museum specimen they have collected, it's almost all across the world. And specifically the Indian specimens here, you can see it's on the top of India where we have the Himalayas, it's China, and then Iran, Afghanistan, Egypt, uh, Oman, Yemen, Iraq. So this is quite a good thing because when you are working with Asian specimens, you have to get like really lucky. You might have to spend your entire life to get one species. So I thank the museums for that. So this is for the leopard specimens that I got. And also uh, there's, there's some on the North America. Okay, I'm sorry, I have to just, okay. Here I have the Ohotonich family. So the pika or the Pikachu that I got, so you can see. So besides all the country's bureaucracy, gathering pika is always difficult because they live in the crevices of the mountains, especially in the mountains like Himalaya, it's, it's up to your luck. You might go for like one year, two year during the monsoon, you might not get them. Even you have to like trace their call and uh, their poops, but still you might not get them. So it's a big thing. So the people who have collected, like I have lots of specimens which have been collected in 1925, 1965, 1958. Those skin specimens work pretty well. So whatever the museum have collected, if they have preserved it well, it can work magic. Even the worst kind of specimen you can use. There are several extraction protocols. And obviously the next generation sequencing procedures are pretty good nowadays. Okay, so here you can see a brief flow chart of my laboratory work. I don't want to repeat, you can just go through quickly and during the question and answer those who are really into the technical things of how I generate the reference genomes, how I extract, so I, we can actually have a long discussion. But still, I'll just quickly go through it. So I use two types of tissue, it's muscle and skin. There I use like two types of extraction protocol. The muscles were actually, uh, the muscle, uh, the specimens from, from which I got the muscles, those are like not older than 30 years, but the skin specimens are even like 100 years old. 
and they were pretty dry. There I used a long extraction protocol uh, provided by one of my collaborators from Australia, although she works on uh, the Australian rodents and, uh, but still it works for me, uh, for my museum specimens where I use the skins and hair to extract the DNA. After that, we did a library preparation. Okay, I can explain these things during the question and answer, as I said earlier. After that, after you prepared the library, what we do, we used bet. Have you ever gone fishing where we use the worms as bet to catch fish? So doing this work, like where we are targeting the mitogenomes and targeting our UCE markers. So we actually design those mRNA bets, which are nothing but the molecular worms for us. So to target our mitogenome. For the mitogenomes, we designed our own bet because there is no urocontoglar or the lagomorph bait is available. Since we planned it earlier, we had to design a urocontoglar bet, not just a lagomorph bait. And the UCE bet is a prescribed one, which was designed by Faircloth in 2012, and it's for the tetrapods, and it's been working really well all across the tetrapods. So here right now you can see on the bottom left, this you see thing, the analysis is still going on. So I cannot share my result right now, but for the mitogenome thing, I can, and I will show you. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, so after doing the entire mitogenome thing, so out of 35 specimens, four did not work at all. But what we developed, like we developed six novel mitogenomes, including two new genera. This is already published. You can check out the paper. This is world's smallest leopard. They are called the pygmy rabbit found in uh, North America on the Western coast, near the Western coast, near California, actually. So this is around like a 17,000 base pair mitogenome. You can see it's a cute rabbit. They are really tiny and they are extremely habitat specific. So you make a little change in their habitat, they might just go extinct. Okay, and then here comes the another star of the evening. They are called the Afghan pika. They are found in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and some pocketed habitats of Iran. They are the Ohotona rufescens. They are very tiny, and this is the first time we have generated this. So this manuscript is like going to get submitted within two days. So yeah. So here we used like two individuals collected in 1965, as I have written it here. And the skin specimen worked really well. And you can see the length of the mitogenome, which is pretty good. From my entire work, we actually found, okay, just let me have some water. My would just dry up, I'm sorry. Yeah, so along with those reference mitogenomes, we found some other information as well. So Lipus tibetanus, you can see this part on your left-hand side that it is usually found in China, Tajikistan, a bit of Kyrgyzstan, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, but we also found them in Iran. Uh, one of my collaborators is from Iran. He actually, like, I'm so grateful that he gave me those specimens. So we can actually say that the range of this particular species should be extended. And we are planning to do a population genetic study uh, later on to do a thorough sampling over those area. And then just my chat board to the left. Okay. On the right-hand side, as I talked about uh, the Afghan paika or the Hotuna rufescens in the previous slide, Yes, here we can see, as I told you, they are found in different pockets of uh, the Central Asia, Iran, and a little bit of Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. We found there are three distinct subpopulations. And uh, in one of our uh, paper by one of my uh, collaborators from Iran, he actually did a, a bit of phylogeny with a little bit of mitochondrial genes earlier, and they found that probably during the Pleistocene glacial event, this divergence happened. But still, we, ha we have to test it with this larger genomic data this time. Okay. Okay. So... And what else did we find? We found 
with all our species that whatever is identified in the museum from their morphology, the genomic studies showed otherwise. This could be something else, especially with one on the left-hand side here, the picture with the label A, it's the Lipus migricollis. It's usually found in uh, India, and there is another one on the right-hand side, but that's on migricollis. But our specimen is found outside this border. Although it is identified as Lipus migricollis, when we did the genomic analysis, the mitogenome showed otherwise. We still cannot figure it out. I think it is due to the hybridization issue. As I told you, the mitogenome and the mitochondrial genes always show that. It's a big problem. As the UC thing is going on, we can actually give you some idea afterwards. Then on the B picture, you can see there is something called Lipus cabensis tibetanus. It turned out to be Lipus oyostolus. It's a woolly hair, mostly found in this Ladakh region of India, which is bordering with the Tibetan, region, Tibetan plateau of China. Then on the picture, see, ah, here comes the mystery man of the evening. We found this dead rabbit. My Swedish collaborator collected it during one of their expedition. When we assembled the mitogenome, it's matching with like for 99% with everything. It's either a heavily hybridized species or maybe something else. But it's very hard to say because we have just one single specimen of it. The quality of the genome is very good. I mean, the mitogenome is very good, but we don't know. So this is found in the Xinjiang area of Lipus, uh, sorry, China. Okay. And then on the left-hand side, you will see the second most species genera, Sylvilagus, which is found in North America and Mexican border. So even with Sylvilagus and uh, there is another one, the Ohotuna Alpina and, oh, sorry. And the Lipus capensis. What I'm trying to say that, well, morphological data is always not enough, but that doesn't mean that, that you have to dismiss the morphological data either from the shape or from the normal uh, coat colors or other, shape, uh, other characteristics that you have to include. So often there is a tug of war between the geneticist and the taxonomists who basically rely, heavily rely on the morphometrics. They're like, no, morphometrics is much better than uh, doing the genomics. And the geneticists say, no, 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 we, let's do the genomics thing. Let's build a tree and let's dismiss the morphometric stuff. No. There are several taxa when you are working on. None of the data could be enough. So it's always good to use both kinds of data and see how your results show up. That's the basic rule for phylogenetics. OK. OK, let me see. Okay. So on the left-hand side, you can see that's the most complete leopard tree published in 2005. That's the last one where they almost include every possible genera. And on the right-hand side, this is the one that I built with all my specimens. And still, like, there are few missing, few, at least five or six genera is missing from Marty's tree. But still, it is almost similar. So we are going good, and we can say, okay, although they use, like, five genes, like two mitochondrial and four nuclear genes, even with the whole mitochondrial genome, it's showing the same way. That means even their work is fine. So that's how things progress. So here on the right-hand side where we have put this A, B, C, D, E, this is on the previous slide where we showed the taxonomic uncertainty, which we still can't identify the species yet. Okay. So after we talked about so many of rabbits, it's important to know whether you work on rabbits, whether you work on virus, whether you work on algae, plant, if you're working on the phylogenies, the tree of life, it doesn't matter what taxonomic system you're working on, but rather the techniques. So I should suggest uh, younger people who are pursuing their masters or bachelors, 
let's focus on the techniques and try to like exchange your skills with others and try to address the larger evolutionary questions. So here I will tell you about my previous work from A3 Bangalore, where I worked on tiny snails. Well, quite a jump from rabbit, which is quite fast with leaps, and then the very slow moving snails, which doesn't even move. So that's my supervisor. I'll explain this treat to you. So on the right-hand side, I was actually looking for this snails, Kremnoconcus. They could be as tiny as mustard seed. And finding them on the roadside during the monsoon, it's hell lot of work and adventure, definitely. Okay, so on the left-hand side, you will see this paper is already public, so you can go through it if you want. So what I'm trying to tell you, here you can see that we have put a tree. So Kremnoconcus is the only freshwater genus belonging to family Littorinidae, uh, commonly known as the periwinkle snails, which like everything is marine except this genus, and which is found on the western coast of India. There's a hill called Western Ghats, and that too on the western slope of that hill. And they have a very specific hab habitat. So if you have waterfalls, so you can see when the water is falling, the water is like spreading, like spread over all over the rocks on both the sides, that's called the spray zone. And this particular snail is actually found in cluster from far away, or even if you go closer to it, you will it will look like, like tiny stone chips, like somewhere in the crevice. You cannot even figure out that that's a snail population there. So here, what I'm trying to say in 1863, just one species was described. And after so many years during this work, we actually found out like more than uh, 10 species, although we haven't put the name. And we even figured out that they have two distinct clades here because this is a dated tree. Here, I want to mention a very important thing, especially for the paleontologists and the people who are working in conservations. People often say that when you have a living species or an extant phylogenetic tree, you don't need fossils to dead them. You can just like, uh, if you do not have, because getting the right fossil is a bit difficult, not a bit difficult, it's quite difficult. And then their taxonomy is like always being debated. You, whether you work on rabbits, whether you work on dinosaurs or birds or anything. So what the conservation biologists or the people who are working on the living species, what they do, they use like, okay, if we do not have the local fossils from that area or from those particular genera, they try to use something which is very close to it. Here, although you can see all the dates are there, but in my opinion, in our opinion, actually, this is not the right date yet because we do not use anything from the Western Ghat sector. This is a global litorinid phylogeny. Just a second. So it's a global, there was a global literary phylogeny what, which was published a few years ago. From there, uh, data, we use those as a secondary date. I'm pretty sure once we start digging in the Western Ghats coast, we might find some periwinkle there because this is a very specific freshwater litorinid. The date might change. So even with the Central Ghat, uh, Central Western Ghats and Northern Western Ghats clade, we might, we must have a, a geological date as well, that when the Central Western Ghats and Northern Western Ghats actually differentiated, we do not have. So here, what I'm trying to highlight that working closely with geologists and paleontologists is a must thing for the conservation biologists. And obviously the evolutionary biologists. So here on the bottom part of this picture, you can see where we are trying to show that how the sea level rise actually gave rise to this freshwater species since all its relatives are marine. And this is the only thing which probably earlier were only like restricted to marine, but slowly it moved to the land and then moved to the freshwater. 
probably, but we really need to test these things later with good fossils. We still do not have it. Okay. So here we have some key takeaway points from today's talk. So let's not keep our research restricted to certain taxa. You can work on any taxa, but rather focus on the techniques that you are using. You could come from any background, physics, mathematics, chemistry, anything, biology, even literature, anything. But how you can use it to address the larger question in evolutionary biology. That's why I put this rabbit with all the subjects. I tried to put most of the subjects which is mostly needed to address the evolutionary puzzle here. Let's say on the left-hand side, I put like museology, the museum specimens, genomics, and morphometrics, which is very important to gather the basic data to build the phylogenetic tree. Phylogenetics is nothing but a tool to give the primary evidence for the evolutionary process. And where you can find, you know, that at which time they have diverged, like from the branch length, you can figure it out. Then once you build that tree, you can actually put your behavioral data, like the shape or anything, any kind of data, like for the snails, what we put, like whether it's a right hand, uh, uh, right handed one, or they have, they are the left handed one, or maybe they are smooth, or they are ribbed, or they have a pointed snail like this. For the rabbits, we actually put the dentitions, or the jaws, or the shape of the skull, everything. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, Okay, I'll continue. Okay, and then what about generating reference genomes and especially the organelle genomes like mitochondria or for in case of plants and chloroplasts? Why? They're small in size. They are more in numbers. It's easy to get them. That's why. But what about the nuclear genome? Of course, you can go do it. You can go for the large whole genome. I mean, the human genome project when it started like 20 years ago, when it cost like billions, billions of dollars. Now it come down to some $200. You can easily do it. It's not a big deal anymore. But why this kind of reference genome should be generated? Especially the people who wants to begin with a population genomic study. They want to see how the population mix with each other. They look at the gene flow, how they move. So if they have a reference genome, they can easily collect like 50, 60, 60 individuals from different population, which are the putative populations. They can easily map. But unless they have a reference genome, it's very difficult to start with. That's a good thing to generate the reference genomes both mitochondrial and of course, uh, uh, mitochondrial chloroplast or the big ones, uh, the nuclear ones. And also for the deep level evolutionary studies, it's easier. And I will always suggest when you are building the evolutionary tree for some non-model, you usually work on non-model organisms, try to use two to three individuals. Well, you never get so lucky. Even with the museum specimens, you ask for four individuals, they give you one. And in the field, if you get lucky, you will get more, but with the permissions of the forest officials or the local stakeholders, it becomes difficult. So you try for four to five samples, you get one, or you might not get anything. Okay. Then what about choosing the appropriate phylogenetic markers? Even Often things, phylogeny, it's always built on genomics data. No, you can go for shape analysis, a lot and lot of shape analysis. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're good, you have two minutes. <laughs> okay, okay, fine, I'm done almost. So, and then using fossils for DT, nothing else. And last but not the least, you must establish strong research collaboration between researchers from different backgrounds. It's very important. And then use your data in a palatable matter, matter to the policymakers and the general public so that people do understand that. Okay. Okay. What happened? 
Okay, so here I want you to see this small video it's for you. So what kind of challenges we face in not only analytical paleobiology, but in length for the evolutionary biology. Can you hear this the sound? This is a videographical abstract of our new paper on the challenges and directions in analytical paleobiology. In the last half century, analytical paleobiology has evolved due to higher computational power, wider community interests, and more available data. However, our field continues to face challenges, some long-lasting and some new. So here, we highlight these from our early career perspective. The first challenge is accounting for biases when interpreting the fossil record. That can be, for example, in a high real diversity locality, but with poor preservation, we get a distorted low face value diversity. And in a low real diversity, but good preservation locality, we get a distorted high face value diversity. We now have more and more the means and knowledge to account for these biases through time and space and to account for taxonomic biases, scale biases and more. The second challenge comes from integrating fossil and modern biodiversity data. There are differences between the different data. Vertebrate fossil data are usually more intercontinental and of a coarser temporal and taxonomic scale, but microfossil data are more regional and of finer temporal scale usually. On the other hand, modern data can be more local and with a very fine temporal and taxonomic scale compared to fossil data. The third challenge comes from building data science skills. Paleobiology is increasingly embracing big data and advanced statistical analysis to explore phylogenies and classification, morphologies of past forms, past ecology, diversity through time and space, past paleoenvironments, and many more. The fourth and last challenge is about increasing data accessibility and equity. Data and resources are more accessible now than ever, but access is not equitable among researchers. There are socioeconomic barriers, institutional barriers, financial barriers, and technological barriers. Not everyone has access to computational resources or to data stewardship and digitization funding or to research and infrastructure funding and paywall access. We need ethical research practices and local collaborations, as well as indigenous data governance and multilingual activities. Last but not least, not everyone has access to database training and travel funding. We have to establish best practices in the broader paleontological community and dismantle systemic inequities in how data have historically been generated, shared and accessed. We need both institutional and individual action to transform the future of how we study the past. And that was the end of this videographical abstract. Thank you so much for sticking until the end. You can scan the QR code or follow the link to access our full paper. Okay, anyone wants to like check out her cool graphical abstracts, you can actually subscribe her channel. She's one of my co-author in the paper. So these are my publications, you can go through it. And I am so grateful to all these people, my collaborators, my supervisor, who have been supporting me all throughout. And that's it, and thank you for listening. Okay, so we can start with the questioning, I guess. Thank you so much for your talk. Please go ahead and leave your slides up. We can enjoy the absolutely adorable pictures of your bunnies. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you so much for this excellent talk. Really, really neat to see all of the different things you've done. And I really enjoyed all the very adorable pictures. Um, so now is time for a question and answer. And so we've got a couple of questions already through. But then okay. as a reminder, we will have anybody who has questions, please send them via the chat to the questions at Paleo Perks host. That's very much today and we will get them asked for you. All right, so our first question, which I'm also just going to drop in the chat is from um, K. Sender Sarwan. 
And Sender asks, do we find species complexes like ring species and cryptic species with the ligomorpha, particularly as most ligomorphs appear superficially similar? And are there extreme behavioral differences between the ligomorphs that could be helpful in identifying the different species? Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for this lovely question. Yes. Uh, cryptic species, yes. So in my opinion, since there are lots of ancient hybridization and integration, everything looks cryptic. But that's what we are trying to like solve, but not exactly going by the definition of cryptic species. Like, how should I say? Like, yeah, from the morphological perspective, everything looks cryptic. Even for the mitogenome, it's not very clear. But I guess with the nuclear genome, it will resolve the issue. But I am not aware about the ring species yet. I would check. Yeah, but superficially similar, yes. Especially on this one, you can see, this is the Lipus nigricollis like I have put in the last picture. I clicked it like a, a few months ago in Rajasthan. Like they should have like a black patch on the neck, but here it's not there. It might be something else, but in India, we only find this one species. Okay, are there extreme behavioral differences between lagomorphs? Um, not exactly. Whatever we had, it's done. Like the pikas behave like rodents, like they look like cute rodents, but the rabbits and hares, they like have like big legs, long legs, which is pretty strong. They jump, they leap, and they, uh like crawl through the burrows and they have the similar dentitions yeah so we barely have the extreme behavioral differences yeah if does that uh answer your question uh, if it doesn't i think we'll get another one in the chat um so this was actually asked by two people in slightly different words. So I'm just giving, okay. giving one. Um, this question is, what is the current consensus for the date and the place of origin of the ligomorphs? And does that, that's the first question. And then does the, that um, trait similarity clustering between the ligomorphs appear early on in their fossil? Okay, so in our work, if you check out, so there, we are expecting that it is before the KT transition there are certain lagomorphs. But after the fifth mass extinction, when the dinosaur got extinct, it started diverging, but the rodent started diverging faster. Well, as for the, okay, I have to give a little, uh, I mean, the answer should be a little diverted from lagomorphs because since they are part of the gliers, so, and the rodents and the lagomorphs are diverging at that time. So there are lots of debate that people are thinking, no, they started diverging afterwards, after the 63 million years ago. But there are certain fossil records, which is found in Asia, which is before that, but still that's not properly diagnosed yet. So, but for the North American records where people are used, like they have more fossils and people worked on them, which is pretty much younger, like lesser than 65 million, so around 55 and all. But for Mongolia, yeah. So you can check out one of my paper if you want, that's called Gomphos, which we found in Mongolia, which is neither a rodent nor a logomorph. So there are a few things. And also for the, as you might have remembered, like I showed you the Eurocontoglar superorder where we have the basal Eurocontoglar, those are pretty old, pretty old before the mass extinction. I cannot give you the exact date as we are still working on it. So if you want to talk about it, we can discuss it in private. <laughs> Since it will be on YouTube, I cannot give it now. <laughs> but yes. Fair. That's fair. It's a it's very cool, Clay. Did you want to add anything else to that? Sorry, I interrupted you. I uh, know, no, no, no. It's fine. Yeah. Excellent. So. All right. So we have time for a couple more questions. Um, this one says it's um, really impressive to hear about how you were able to pivot and redesign your whole PhD to still get at some of these very similar questions. And so now that you've had this experience approaching these questions with paleogenomics, how does this inform a hypothetical approach to your original field-based study? Would you try and do that again? Would it, how would it change? Um, 
so <laughs> hypothetical approach to our original field-based fossil study. Well, uh, we already have the fossils in our collections. I only showed you like two, three things, but there were several. So from the fossils, we, did, we designed the study. We designed the study to study the extant lagomorphs. So usually what people do, they do the extant study first and then try to approach the fossils. But in my case, it was opposite for the lagomorphs. We already had the fossils and that's how my professor designed the project. She was looking for someone who can work on the living lagomorphs. Gotcha. All right. So <laughs> at this point, we have one question left in our queue. So if anybody else has a question, this otherwise this will be our last question. But if anyone has one more, we can get it in before that. Um, so this question says, what is the specific reason for the high species distribution of um, Chronomococcus? I didn't do that one right. Um, is it due to the highly selective na or secluded nature of sky islands in the Western Ghats, like the Solo Sky Islands? Similar mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. Let me finish that. Yeah, that's a very good question. It's true because on the Western Ghats, since uh, what you are mentioning, I don't know how much you are um, well acquainted with the Western Ghats geography. It's like those waterfalls are really secluded from each place to another. All throughout, it's not connected. Yes, it's because of that. And as you know, snails cannot move much. Yep. Exactly, they are pretty secluded. Like we have like literally one each and like every waterfall we are checking, whatever we are getting, it's like different. And we were kind of scared in the beginning, like what? Every each and every species in every waterfall is different. Oh, wow. Oh yes, I know about the Shola Islands there. Yeah, the bird lab, Isotheropathy. Yes, I have heard about that. That's, that sounds like a really cool place to be able to work with the <laughs> biodiversity. Yeah. All right. So I think that was our last question. So I'm going to just go ahead and take us out. So um, thank you so much for this really interesting talk and great discussion afterwards. And thank you to everybody else for joining us today. Um, we'd like to invite you ne back next week for a talk not on August 29th, um, but rather on um, September 5th, I guess. 5th. <laughs> I think, yeah, something like that. Um, so please join us next Tuesday, uh, where Francesca Galazzo, who's at the um, Center for Natural Museum in Germany, will be giving a talk entitled The Principle of Teratology and, Sporomorph and Sporomorphs. So we're, we're sticking around in, in paleontology, but changing taxa quite quite considerably. Um, so we hope to see you all next week. Um, now we do have um, tea time with today's speaker. And you can ask all about all of the really cool things that she's been working on for the last many years. And um, today's question of the week is if you could be any small mammal for a day, which would you choose and why? Um, so now I've got a two minute break. Um, feel free to get up, walk around, bring back your pets, and we'll see you hopefully back for some, some nice informal conversation. So thank you again for joining us and either see you in two minutes or see you in a week or sometime down the road. <laughs>